Hi, this is Tim Gridge, and welcome to another episode of Fronesis. We have been talking about switching containers. This has been so profound. So many lives have been touched. So many destinies have been affected. If you've missed any of this part, I think we're on episode five now of this particular series. If you've missed any of it, you can go to the Fronesis Africa YouTube channel or my YouTube channel, p.tim, and gain access to this information. It will bless you. So Paul, speaking about the mind, divides the mind for us into two parts. There is the content of the mind and then there's the container of the mind and they do two different things. The content of the mind creates an event whereas the container of the mind creates a cycle or a pattern. The content of the mind um, creates an activity whereas the container of the mind creates a habit. When we speak about the content of the mind, we're talking about what you are thinking about. But when we speak about the container of the mind, we're speaking about why you think like that. Let's say a person is obese and the person wants to lose weight. If all the person does is just engage in, in activities to help them lose weight, and we see this all the time, they might even succeed in losing weight. But after a period of time, they find themselves gaining the weight back. Why? Because they change the content of the mind but they did not change the container Jesus puts it this way he said that it is like putting new wine in old wine skin at first it will look fine everything will be fine they're losing the weight they're losing the weight and they've reached their target weight and then all of a sudden it's a little here it's a little there it's a little there something here happens blah 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 and they gain the weight back sometimes it's even worse off they gain more weight than before why because like Jesus said when you put new wine in old wineskin it says the old wineskin it's inflexible it is inflexible and so the wine will expand and it will break the wineskin the same thing here if we are going to experience change lasting change habitual change where success has become a pattern a certain level of success has become a pattern and not an event a certain level of elevation has become a pattern and not an event Guess what? It will be because we did not just change the content of this bottle, but we changed the bottle altogether. This is where this whole series and, and what this whole series has been about. Now, I have also now mentioned one of the steps necessary to expand or change the size of this bottle, um, in this case of your mind. And I can't dwell on it anymore, but we looked at it last week where we, we addressed the missing link as it relates to meditation. Many people are confessing, but there is a missing link that they are not adding to that confession and, and so they are not rewriting the script that their subconscious is playing out remember today I was driving we have moved offices but today as I was driving to the office guess what I began to drive towards my old office why because I've been driving to my old office for years and that's the thing about the subconscious the subconscious takes you to the familiar space the sub look you could introduce a new thought but if you have not rewritten the script that your subconscious is playing, the subconscious is wired to take you to a familiar space. Have you been there before? Have you noticed that when you are going to a place that you are familiar with, you can go there without thinking? But when you are going to a place you have not been before, have you noticed that you engage your conscious mind? You engage your conscious mind. You engage your conscious mind so that you, you, you pay attention to the road, so that you don't make the wrong turning. The same thing here. If we do not rewrite the script in our subconscious, we will keep replaying negative patterns or old patterns that we want to do away with. And this is why changing, and, and I taught you on this. For the last two weeks, actually, I focused on this. The missing link, the extra step that you can take to biohack, to go deep into your subconscious so that you don't just rewrite the thoughts in your mind which will create an immediate result it's an event but the event will fade you can rewrite the script in your subconscious so that you keep um, replaying that event till it's no longer an event it's now an experience it's now a constant experience but step number two after you've done the one that I taught you last two creatures on meditation, it is the right relationships. Right relationships will change your life 
live forever. There is a popular research, you should have heard of it, they say that your current financial state, for example, is the average of the top five people you spend the most of your time with. Why? Because if you have become the sharpest pencil in that pencil case, that pencil case has become too small and you are going to limit your ability to expand if you are not surrounded by people who are operating consistently at the level that you desire to operate, whether it's to have a great marriage, whether it's to build a bigger business, whether it's to change your current income status, whether it's to live a holier life, to pray longer, to fast longer. If your current circle are not filled with people or is not filled with people that actually operate there as a lifestyle, you will struggle to maintain that lifestyle. If everybody in, in your current circle is either at your level or operating less than what you want to operate in, then you will actually not even remain at your level. You will actually begin to drop. It is necessary for you to become connected to individuals deliberately so that are pushing and bench pressing at the level you want to bench press in life, whatever um, that area of your life might be. I, 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 I remember finding myself in a situation where there was a change that I needed in my life and I saw that nobody in my life at that point in time was pulling those results. I have had to pay certain people money to sit with me, buy their time to sit with me because I could see that they were too busy for me to get a, an appointment with them. So I paid them for their time to sit with me um, on a continuous basis so that I could begin to glean, just by, that, by virtue of that exposure, begin to glean from their consistent level of success. And guess what? I noticed that it became easier and easier for me to operate at that same level. So we see Saul, the one that became King Saul. He spends time with Samuel, who was already the judge of the entire nation in a short while. Saul becomes the king of the entire nation. It's not by chance. The reason why Saul was sent to Samuel is because this was a man that was already operating at that level. The problem with Saul, though, when he became king, he did not continue his relationship with the one that had already been operating at that level. He goes back and he relates with the people that he has always related with. And guess what? He loses the kingdom. When you as a king, and you, you, you are now the king, you are the head honcho in that environment, and there is no one challenging you, you will begin to regress. And so Solomon, I mean, um, Saul regressed. If he had stayed with Samuel, someone who was always operating at that level of integrity, operating at that level of leadership, guess what? Saul would have sustained the kingdom. It is necessary for you to do an audit of your current relationship and begin to say, this this is, this is the change I need in my marriage. This is the change I need in my business. This is the change I need in my, in my walk with God. This is the change I need in my prayer life. I need to be able to fast more and then ask yourself, who is pulling those results? They might not let you immediately into their circle. But you need to become deliberate. If you will become deliberate to force your way and, and, and meander your way into their circle, you will notice by default you will upgrade your standard. Do you want to change the capacity? And that's what I'm going to deal with now, this issue of capacity. Do you want to change the capacity? of your mind so that you can accommodate more, do more for God, achieve more, experience more. Change your current relationship. Do a relationship audit and bring yourself into the room of people that don't experience what you desire as events. Bring yourself into the room of people that experience what you desire as a way of life. It will change your life. If this has been helpful, make sure you share this information, um, both the times, um, our TBN times, but also um, the information that is, because this will also be present on our YouTube channel. Make sure that you share that as well. This has been Tim Grage, Senior Pastor of the City of Zion, saying, switch containers. God bless you. Catch you again soon. Hello, viewers. I am Humphrey Oseni.
And I'm really thrilled to be on this marvelous broadcast. And I tell you, oh, God is doing great things. I'll be continuing my series on living from and in a higher dimension. We are living in a higher dimension if you are in Christ. You're not on earth. Your body is on earth. And we speak and manifest on earth, but we are in heaven. Hallelujah. Colossians 1.13 says, Who has translated us from the authority of the kingdom and realm of darkness into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of light. So we're in another kingdom and we need to be conscious of it. And that's what the gospel is all about. Telling people that come into Christ, you come into a new realm, a new dimension. And telling believers that you are in a higher dimension. And if you don't know it, the devil will take advantage of you, mess you up, oppress you, mess your family, mess your business, mess your life. We are to live a higher life. Now look at what Jesus Christ says in John chapter 3, verse 13. He said, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in heaven. So Jesus said, I came from heaven, but I'm still in heaven. Hallelujah. No one before Christ had come from heaven. But child of God, when you come into Christ, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are translated. Your spirit is in heaven. You live from heaven. You live in heaven like Jesus did. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Now let's look at a model prayer. Matthew chapter 6, the model prayer. Hallelujah. And we look at Matthew 6 verse 9. This is a very popular uh, prayer, common prayer. He says, they asked him, how do we pray? They want to learn how to pray. And Jesus Christ said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father, those two words, I can preach for one, two hours just from the revelation of the words, our Father. What was Jesus saying when he said, our Father? This was revolutionary. This was unprecedented. No one in the Old Testament called God Father. They called him God. They saw themselves as servants. Just the word, our Father, Jesus Christ is identifying the fact of his relationship. God is not just a God, a judge. He is a father. And whenever Jesus related prayer to parenthood or fatherhood, it brings out so much power, so much expectancy. He said, you that are evil know how to give good things to your children. How much more? You see, when you pray from that standpoint, that perspective, faith, comes alive. Because he's saying, fathers provide, fathers love, fathers care, fathers protect. So you are praying with the consciousness that God is my father, which means you are praying with the consciousness that God will provide for me much more than my earthly parents can provide for me. There is an expectation that if my heavenly, earthly parents can love me and provide for me, God will do much more because he's my father. You are saying, the one who owns the whole universe, the one who has all power and might, oh, is my father. You are talking to him as a father, a son to a father. I mean, if Bill Gates was your father, if Jeff Bezos was your father, if Elon Musk was your father, you will know that poverty is gone. Hallelujah. But we don't pray like that. We pray like God is far away. Oh, we don't even know how much he loves us. We are not even sure. That's why there is doubt when we pray, because we're not praying from the right standpoint. We're not praying from a higher dimension. We're not praying from understanding our relationship. That's why Jesus could speak to storms. He could face Pilate without fear. He could stand before any situation absolutely fearless because he says, our Father. God is our Father. In those days, if you have a bully in school, maybe primary school, secondary school, high school, and this bully is bullying somebody, and, and the person says, my senior brother is around. <laughs> he can smile, knowing, especially if he knows the senior brother is stronger than the bully, bigger than the bully. Our father is bigger than any bully. Satan is a bully. Demons are bullies. But we have our father. We have our father. You know what Satan said to Jesus as a temptation? He said, if you are a son of God, let me put it this way, if God is your father, and notice something, Satan for, did not include the statement because this was after John the Baptist baptized Jesus. This was about 40 days after. 
And a voice spoke from heaven, Behold my son, God was speaking, my son in whom I well pleased. Satan removed that part, my beloved son. He removed the part in whom I well pleased. and said, if, if you are the son of God, turn the stone to bread. Because if you know that God is a loving father, oh, the temptation will always fail. It will always fail. Are you hearing me? And that's why Christians fall into temptation. Jesus understood his relationship with God. He understood his identity as a son. And a son can turn stone to bread. If he, if he couldn't turn stone to bread, it's not a temptation. Beloved of God, the more we understand sonship, the greater our capacity for faith, the greater authority and power we're walking. So he said, our father, he's trying to introduce them that, look, God is no more just a God. They knew God before. <laughs> they were Jews. They've been reading the Torah. But he said, look, I want to tell you something. When you pray, say, our father. Relate with him as a father who owns it all and who is all powerful and who loves you. Number two point we get there. I wish we had time. The whole prayer is loaded with revelation. This model prayer, loaded with revelation, beloved of God. Who art in heaven? Who are in a higher dimension? Remember John 3, 31. He that is from above is above all. Heaven is above earth. When you are conscious your father is in heaven, he's above sickness, he's above poverty, he's above every curse, he's above every situation. You know that in any situation you are in, because my father is above, I'm above. Because he's in heaven, I'm born of God, I'm in heaven. Hallelujah. I'm in a higher dimension. Beloved of God, we need to catch this revelation. Meditate upon it. Think over it. Say it to yourself over and over again. Anytime you pray, say, I'm in heaven. Say, and my father is in heaven, and my father is above all, and I'm above all. I'll tell you, I'm above cancer. I've seen cancers healed. I've seen tumors die. Sometimes while I'm preaching, as I'm preaching to you right now, I, the power of God is being released. Tumors are dying. Begin to thank God for your healing where you are right now. Rejoice. I'm no more under the earth. I'm in heaven. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I am blessed. My business is blessed. My family is blessed. No devil or witchcraft can work against me. I operate from heaven. I'm above their jurisdiction. Child of God, we've got authority. We've got power in prayer. When we pray from the revelation of the Our Father, who art in heaven, not on earth, not below devils, far above every devil, and we are seated with him. We are above. We have a higher life. We have authority to command and they must obey, to command mountains and they'll move. Oh, you'll see miracles when you catch his revelation. He was elevating their prayer life. When we understand that God is a father, not just saying it. People say it nonchalantly like a cliche. He's a real father. We are real spiritual biological children of God. We have him backing us. For if God be for us, who, what can be against us and who can lay a charge? There's no accusation against God's elect. There's no accusation, no condemnation in Christ. Beloved of God, we are in heaven. There's no sin in heaven. There's no sickness in heaven. There's only abundance. And I tell you, I've had visions of heaven. And one of the visions I had of heaven, I was walking on the streets, and I saw no shadows. And I, I, all the visions I've had, there have been no shadows. Not a single shadow. And I heard, in him is no darkness at all. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I heard, there's no shadow of turning. So I knew. Okay. Okay. That's why there are no shadows. There's no sickness, no poverty, no fear. No darkness in heaven at all. Child of God, we live in a realm where darkness cannot operate. So, beloved of God, God bless you and keep on living above darkness. Living in light, in victory, in freedom. Living in a higher dimension. God bless you. Good day. This is Pastor Gelo Lukama. I am coming to you all the way from Johannesburg, South Africa, senior pastor of the Rama Church. It is indeed a blessing to come to you today and share in the word of the Lord as we continue on the series that we started previous weeks on eternal promises. Last time we talked about eternal rewards and I want to once again come and talk about the battles of rewards. Matthew chapter 6 verses 1, I'll read from the uh, Good News translation. It says this verses 1 through verses 4. He said, make certain that you do not perform your religious duties in public so that people will see what you do. If you do these things publicly, you will not have any reward from your Father 
in heaven. So, when you give something to a needy person, do not make a big show of it, as hypocrites do in the houses of worship and on the street. They do it so that people will praise them. I assure you, they have already been paid in full. Verses 3. When you help a needy person, do it in such a way that even your closest friend will not know about it. it then it will be a private matter. Your father who sees what you do in private will reward you. Beloved, there is a battle that goes in the question of rewards. Ultimately, what do we call reward? The acknowledge of the masses or the acknowledgement of God? The applause of people or the well done of God? So many people are so obsessed. Listen, there's nothing wrong with doing something everybody appreciates, doing something that the masses really celebrate. But we come into a season where we become obsessed with the views, with the likes, with the followers, and that begins to push us to seek for their validation instead of ease validation. The battle of reward is, is saying to us, beloved, that we, we are so often and almost tempted to trade in eternal reward for earthly acknowledgement. And that's the reason why, once again, I want to tell you that there is nothing wrong with being rewarded here on earth, with being acknowledged, with being appreciated, with being celebrated. But the Bible is warning us against doing everything so that the masses can come to appreciate. Because if what you are pursuing, the Bible says, you have already gotten it. You have already gotten your salary. You have already gotten, if, if, it, is, if it was attention you needed, you already got your payment. If it was clout you wanted, you already got your payment. If it was applause you needed, you already got your payment. But do not expect God to do anything further than what you required. And that's why you have a lot of people in church. They do things so that pastor will see me. They do things because Mam Fundisi will see me. They do things so that, you know, such and so will see me, will notice me. But at the end of the day, God is saying to us in Matthew chapter 6, he says that if that's what you are pursuing, know that that's all you are going to get. But listen, he says when you perform your religious duties, when you pray, when you give, do it in private. What does that say? You are doing it without requiring reward from the person that is benefiting from it. You are doing it without demanding that such person acknowledge you, serve you, worship you, or do whatever that they need to do. But you are preventing them, say, listen, if there is one you want to praise, it is God the Almighty. That's the reason why I am excited when I read about uh, Acts chapter 3. The Bible said there was a man that was begging at the, at the gate called Beautiful. The Bible says he was begging for alms. Seeing Peter and John coming, he says, I want you to give me something. The Bible says they ask him to face them. Look at us in the high. He says, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have, we give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. The Bible says immediately his ankle bones receive strength and the man began to leap. Listen, this guy did not go down and begin to worship these people that were able to raise him from the, from the ground and be able. The man never walked in his life, but the Bible says he entered into the temple praising, leaping and giving glory, not to Peter and John, but giving glory to God. Listen, when that praise happens, Guess what? The God who Peter and John serves, he grants them the reward. That's the reason why there are three things I want you to note very important. Never trade your heavenly reward at the expense of your soul. So many people, because of 
rewards that the world promises. They are ready to trade their soul. Your soul is valuable. Your soul cannot be for sale. Your soul cannot be on the market. You cannot put your soul for any sort of a crown or acknowledgement for any sort of uh, platforms. Your soul cannot be traded. Never give your soul in trade for your heavenly reward. Listen, there are people who are giving, pursuing earthly reward at the expense of their heavenly reward. And these are the ones that Matthew 6 verses 1 through verses 4 warns us of that you are indeed pursuing only what you can see with your eyes. You are pursuing only what you can feed in your tummy. You are pursuing only what you can put physically on your life, but at the expense of what God reserved for you. Today, I want you to understand that there is nothing on earth worth trading heaven for. I will say it again. There is absolutely nothing on earth that is worth you trading heaven for. The reward of heaven is eternal. The reward of earth is temporary. And lastly, beloved, there are people who are ready to trade earthly rewards at the expense of loved ones. This is so common. We have seen friends, people sacrifice their children, their cousins, their nephews, their nieces. Why? I want a promotion. No, they promise that if, if I give my child, they, 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 they will give me a crown. How, how long are you going to be in that position? How long are you going to be sitting in that? There is no reward on earth that is worth the life of your kids. There is no reward on earth that is worth the life of your spouse. And that's why it is only in Christ Jesus that we can be fulfilled. And today I want to encourage you. Do not trade your heavenly reward for earthly rewards. Do not trade your soul for earthly rewards. Do not trade your children, your spouse, your loved ones, your family members for any position or for any monetary gain. There is only God who truly knows how to reward. The Bible says he sees in the secret, meaning that even what people did not notice, God notices and he rewards always publicly. I pray today you are encouraged to hold on and just know that God we serve is not just the God who opens the door, he gives platforms. Not only he gives platforms, he gives opportunities. And those opportunities never come at the expense of your soul. For Jesus Christ has died for you, and once he died for you, it is over. You only have to serve him with everything. I pray that you are blessed and encouraged in the mighty name of Jesus. Will you have me pray for you? Father, in Jesus' name, your people are blessed. May they always know that you see in secret and you reward publicly. Father, those that have served, those that have prayed, those that have given without people knowing, Lord, in Jesus' name, let their reward be public. I pray in Jesus' name and I prophesy over your life, everyone watching today, that in this season, the Lord shall publicly reward you. In Jesus' name, amen. Write to us a testimony if you have, and we'll be encouraged to see you once again next time. You're watching this right now, and it's not a coincidence. I want to introduce you to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you backslid, maybe you were there before, or maybe you don't know him. I get to tell you that God is a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. And I want you to pray this prayer with me so that you can receive the destiny that God has in store for you. Just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you died and rose again that you are the Son of God, and by your blood, my sins are forgiven. I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. 
If you've just said that prayer, congratulations, you are a child of God, heaven has rejoiced. And if you have said that prayer, I want to offer you one of my free ebooks in order to help you get on with your walk with God. God bless you.